Absolve, O Lord, the souls of all the faithful departed from every bond of sin. Eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. Words from today's gradual and tract. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God is wonderful in his saints. Through his mystics, he often communicates to us the secrets of time and eternity. In the life of the mystic sister Josefa Menendez, you can read about her in the book, it's called The Way of Divine Love, and she received these mystical touches, visions, vocations, back in the 1920s. And in her life, we find that His Majesty put her in touch with many souls in purgatory. They came to solicit her suffrages and sacrifices. At first, she was frightened. Who wouldn't be? By degrees, however, she became accustomed to their confidences She listened to them, asked them their names, encouraged them, and very humbly recommended herself to their intercession, that is, when they would attain heaven, that they would pray for her. The lessons these holy souls inculcated are worth remembering, and here are a few. Once a nun came to her, who on her entrance into heaven confided to Sister Josepha, how different the things of earth appear when one passes into eternity. All God counts is the purity of our intention when performing our duties of our state in life, even in the smallest acts. How little is the earth and all it contains, and yet how loved it is. Ah, what comparison is there between life, however prolonged, and eternity? If only it were realized how in purgatory the soul is wearied and consumed with desire to see God face to face. There were also some poor souls who, having escaped through God's mercy from a still greater peril, came to beg Sister Josepha to hasten their deliverance. I am here by God's great mercy, one of them said, for my excessive pride had brought me to the gates of hell. I influenced a great number of other people and now I would gladly throw myself at the feet of the most abject pauper. Have compassion on me and do acts of humility to make reparation for my pride. Thus you will be able to deliver me from this abyss. Another confessed, I have spent seven years in mortal sin and three years ill in bed, and I always refused to go to confession. I was ripe for hellfire and would have fallen into it if by your present sufferings you had not obtained for me the grace of repentance. I am now in purgatory, and I entreat you, since you were able to save me, draw me out of this dreary prison. Still another said to her, I am in purgatory because of my infidelity, for I would not correspond with God's call. For twelve years I held out against my vocation and was in the greatest peril of damnation. Because in order to stifle my conscience, I gave myself up to a life of sin. Thanks to the divine goodness which deigned to make use of your sufferings, I took courage to come back to God. And now, of your charity, get me out of this gloomy prison. Another said, who was just about to leave purgatory, offer the blood of Christ for us. What would become of us if no one were to help us? A priest said to her from purgatory, how great is the mercy of God when he deigns to make use of the sufferings of other souls to repair our infidelities. What a degree of glory I might have acquired had my life been different. And I corresponded with the graces God had given me. The names of these holy souls 
who were personally unknown to Sister Josepha. She carefully noted them down, the date and the place of their decease, and she verified them, and sure enough, they were all legit. Proved that these were real communications with souls in purgatory. Now, one of the reasons why the poor souls come to the mystics is that there's a deep kinship between them. That is to say, each and every holy soul in purgatory is now a mystic and a contemplative. I'm not just saying that to make you feel good about the souls in purgatory. It's very painful being a mystic and a contemplative. But how can this be? How can they be mystics and contemplatives? Well, because mystics, if you study the writings of mystical doctors like St. Teresa of Jesus, the Carmelite foundress, and St. John of the Cross, you find out that mystics are those who seek God in themselves. And they find him. The great mystic St. Teresa of Jesus explained it in terms of a question. She says, are we seeking ourselves in God or are we seeking God in ourselves? So are you seeking yourself in God or are you seeking God in yourself? There's a world of difference between these two things. Fallen man starts out his spiritual life seeking himself in God. That's selfish. What's he really seeking? Me. I'm looking for myself. But as he grows, he will start to seek God in himself, which is seeking God. At the point of her deeper conversion, if you know the life of St. Teresa of Jesus, 20 years she lived a lukewarm religious life. But at the point of her deeper conversion, St. Teresa said, Up till now, it has been my life that I've lived, but now God lives in me. She was shocked to find out how close he was. He's right here. St. Augustine, if you study his life, described how he sought God everywhere in order to find him until he finally looked inside. That can be a haunting experience looking inside because it may be empty. He may not be in there. Then you got to do something about it. It is very important to note that the transition in the life of St. Teresa of Jesus, it took place from seeking self in God to seeking God in self. That marked the time that Teresa became a mystic and a sincere and effective contemplative. So to find God, Teresa says to her nuns, all she needs to do is to be alone and to contemplate Him in herself. Commenting on a line from St. John's Gospel, the line I'm speaking of here, the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. That's from the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel. St. Thomas Aquinas, commenting on this line, notes that bad servants do not know what their master is doing. What things don't they know? St. Thomas says, strictly speaking, they do not know what God does in us. They do not know what God does in us. This is spoken by a mystic and it's spoken like a mystic. Someone who knew God from the inside. At first, this truth of looking and finding God inside our souls may sound us a little bit suspicious. I don't know about you, but when I first heard it, my alarm bell started to go off. Because today, let's face it, the devil has all his contemplatives. He's got his own contemplatives, and there are a lot of them. We generally call them New Agers. But sadly, even Christians have adopted these diabolical methods of contemplation. 
And these are basically various kinds of methods seeking self in God through ourselves. They use various kinds of religion for self-realization, self-fulfillment. In other words, they're seeking self in religion. Man takes this path because he's trying to satisfy his nature. And our nature is religious. We cannot escape it. We are religious beings. It's how it is. Yet it is only with baptism that God comes to dwell in the soul by grace. If you recall, St. Joan of Arc, when she was on trial, she was asked if she were in a state of grace. And she fittingly replied, If I am, may God keep me there. If I am not, may He put me there. We are put into a state of grace through baptism and later by way of confession when, God forbid, our baptismal robe has been lost. So with baptism, God comes and dwells inside of us. And only after some time of struggle and passing through many purifications and trials, it's often called the purgative way for that reason, you're being purged. Then by the grace of God does the faithful servant of Christ begin to detach, to pull away from all things of this world, to seek God alone, to seek God for who He is. Goodness itself, love itself, truth itself. Instead of seeking consolations from God, which is the same as seeking self in God. I love you, God, for what you do for me. Give me some more sugar. It is in this way that the soul begins to seek God in the interior of his own self by passing through a purgative life. Note, by the way, that when the New Agers try to do this, try to seek God in themselves, they follow the path of the devil which is to mistake themselves for God, making themselves a sort of God, or to somehow tap into the energy force of the universe. And they see it, it's inside me. All I got to do is tap into it. That's New Age. And that's why when I first heard about this, I was like suspicious. Whoa, I don't know about that seeking God in yourself. Unfortunately, when living in this world, our body and all things material often distract us from seeking and finding God on the inside. This is why we have cloisters. This is why we have monasteries. This is why saints in the past have fled to some desert, at least for a time, to find silence and solitude. They were seeking God where He could be found, inside. And if he wasn't there, they quickly went and put him there. Through baptism, through confession. Now, back to purgatory. Once we die in a state of grace, we will most assuredly find him. God. Truth. Love. Nothing will prohibit us from seeing Him in our own souls. Not face to face, but we will see Him because we will be in a state of grace. We will see Him through faith. Our intellects will be perfectly rectified. There will be no error left. We will know Him, and that makes all souls and purgatories mystics. They know God as mystics do, through themselves and in themselves. They know what God does in them, as St. Thomas said. According to the teaching of the angelic doctor, the souls in purgatory know God by some sort of vision through their own essence that's through their own souls. Similar to how the angels know God. In other words, they'll have perfect recollection. They'll never not think and look upon God. Now, 
The separated souls in purgatory, seeing their own supernaturalized souls, behold themselves in a state of grace and charity. In other words, they are very much aware of their own participation in the divine nature. Their knowledge of God is therefore the intuitive sense of the divine presence in their souls, which is the definition of mystical contemplation, which is called mystical from its effects of infused knowledge by St. Teresa of Jesus. So they become mystics using all the writings of the mystics. It fits. But the will... Hmm. Our wills in purgatory, the wills of the holy souls remain attached to many things, making purgatory essentially the mystical purification of the will from adherence to the finite. Thus must all who are saved tread the mystical way to union. There's a few that do it while they're on earth. And there are many who do it hereafter. There is this to observe about the mystic state, that it is a state of suffering and joy, both so intense as to anticipate, if it were, if we may reverently conjecture, the condition of purgatory. If you read the lives of the mystics, they go through these intense moments caused by this mystical infusion of knowledge and their lower nature rebelling against it. Very intense and anticipates the condition of purgatory. The mystic has his purgatory here, in other words. And once again, few souls are brave enough to endure it. So again, all the souls in heaven are mystics, contemplatives. They look upon God face to face. We either do it all now in this life or later in purgatory. Not surprisingly, the saints recognized one of the biggest hindrances to contemplative life was the body and all its needs. And this is why they practiced so much mortification. This is why they went into the desert. This is why they fasted. His body was always getting in the way of their knowing and loving God in themselves. My goodness, what would they say of our time with TV, movies, and all sorts of stuff to distract us from seeing God where He can be found? Let us then strive to seek God inside as the souls in purgatory do by embracing our baptismal vows. And if we look inside and can't find God, let's run to confession and put Him there. Let us become mystics now to cease being servants and become friends so that the saying of St. Paul may be fulfilled in us, that God would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened by His Spirit with might unto the inward man that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth. To know also the charity of Christ which surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God such that we can say these words with St. Paul and I live now not I but Christ liveth in me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.